to Jewish misconceptions and objections. We're going to look at lesson six here now. What is true Christianity? Part three. So, a couple of things we're going to look at here in this lesson. We're going to discover the origin of false Christianity. Where it came from, when did it originate? At one point was what is now Roman Catholicism, was that at one point the true church? Understand the anti-Semitism that spewed from this false church. If one were to scour the pages of the New Testament, if you were to look through the New Testament, to try and find some kind of evidence of teachings of a pope, or a church hierarchy, cardinals, bishops, and so on, they would come up empty-handed. The New Testament speaks of bishops and elders, both of which being synonymous with the term pastor. Calling any religious teacher father is expressly forbidden, according to the scripture. And it's at its inception that the church, the true church, the church of the Bible, the church spoken of in the scripture in the New Testament, consisted primarily at its inception of Jewish men and women that believed that Jesus was the Messiah. This is something that's not necessarily understood very well in Jewish circles. Many times the church in its inception, its origin, is looked at as a Gentile thing. It's looked at as a, a non-Jewish entity from the get-go, which is what we do not see in the pages of scripture and in history. So where did this false church, the church that brought about so much persecution and hatred of the Jewish people in the name of Christ, where did it come from? Where did it originate? It was not at any point in time the true church. It was only after that Christianity, quote unquote, became the official state religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine in the fourth century that these new heretical teachings were formulated. In his book, Constantine's Sword, James Carroll, a Roman Catholic priest, by the way, tells the story of the church and the Jews. He is obviously biased in his perspective on church history. He, at regular intervals, interjects statements that attempt to paint the early church in the likeness of Roman Catholicism. He's trying to retroactively fit Roman Catholicism to be the true church spoken of in the Bible. He says this, the early Jesus movement had developed probably by the mid to late second century into something we can call the church. Now that statement by itself has some problems. Dividing itself into dioceses and provinces. You see where he's getting into this? with local bishops serving as an ecclesiastical equivalent of a regional governor. You can see here how he's trying to rewrite history, to repaint how the church worked, how the church was organized, based on the current organization of the Roman Catholic Church. The church had redefined Rome as its administrative seat. He's saying that this all happened in the mid to late second century. Not true. A decision tied as much to organizational as to religious demands, even if the ancient connection to Peter was always emphasized. Now, this idea with Peter being the first pope, we're going to get into that in another lesson. But the idea of the papacy, the idea of a pope was the official title given or endowed upon the bishop or pastor of Rome. We do not find that the case with Peter according to the scripture, as we'll see in another, another lesson. The ancient connection to Peter that Carol mentions is an absolute fallacy, absolutely untrue and is promoted for the sole purpose of validating the office of Pope. In Carroll's rewriting of church history, especially those early centuries in which the Roman Catholic Church did not exist, he attempts to make things 
biblical or have biblical validation or even historical validation that are simply not true, that are the inventions of men. Promoted for the sole purpose of validating the office of Pope. We will examine this idea in greater detail later. In the first century, there was a group of people known as the Nicolaitans. They held to a form of church hierarchy. This is something that's spoken of in Scripture, the Nicolaitans. They held to a form of church hierarchy that Jesus specifically condemns in the book of Revelation. That movement, as well as what became the Roman Catholic Church in the fourth century, both put more authority on sinful man than on a literal interpretation of Scripture. Now, part of the reason why some Jewish people in different Jewish backgrounds and sects and different kinds of Jewish belief systems, denominations, if you will, the reason why lots of them will kind of identify with Roman Catholicism, even though they may have hatred or distaste or uh, hatred or dislike for it in their heart, ironically, it's very similar to rabbinical Judaism. How so? Well, tradition and liturgical teachings by the leadership are held to a higher level, even that above Scripture. Those teachings and those traditions interpret the Scripture to give you the true meaning. As with the Pope and bishops and priests and cardinals, so it is with rabbis many times. And so, in this idea of Nicolaitanism, more authority was placed upon sinful man. These were not saved people. As we mentioned in the other lesson about having a new heart, being born again, having the Spirit of God dwell within you, that is not the case with these people that claimed to be Christian. They were not saved, not born again individuals. They weren't believing in what Jesus actually taught and trusting in him by faith. They were imposters. Deceived, maybe even in themselves deceived, but imposters nonetheless. They put more authority on sinful man than on a literal interpretation of Scripture. Prayers for the dead, infant baptism, sacraments, indulgences, the exaltation of Mary as immaculately conceived, meaning that she was without sin, uh, the title Mother of God, prayers to the saints, the sacrifice of the mass, the designation of clergy as priests, and the church's power to grant sainthood are only a few of the countless doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church that have no origin in the pages of the New Testament. We will examine some of these doctrines in the following lessons. I'd like to share with you a quote. This is a rather lengthy quote once again from Carol's Constantine's Sword. It very well summarizes the event that basically created the Roman Catholic Church. I do find error, however, with the statement Carol makes within it that I'll explain after the quote. The night before the battle at the Milvan Bridge on the Tiber, Constantine saw a cross in the sky. Okay, the Roman Emperor Constantine. He saw a cross in the sky above with this, this legend, this sign, in hoc signo vinces, meaning in this sign, conquer. With the news of this vision, a signal of favor from the Christian God, which was just basically lumped in together with all the other Roman gods, Constantine's troops rallied, went firmly into battle the next day, and won Constantine himself through Maxentius, Constantine's competition for the throne, off the bridge. Hmm. Threw him into the Tiber where he drowned. On the strength of that vision and its fulfillment, the emperor became a Christian. So did his army. And ultimately, so did the empire. <sighs> Christian in name only. This guy, he just threw somebody off a bridge that was his competition for the throne. 
and now his entire army is going to be called Christian. In a way, this is still from Carol's Constantine Sword, in a way, this is the second greatest story ever told. Maybe according to you, at least concerning what we think of as a Western civilization. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, the conversion of Constantine may have been the most implication-laden event in Western history. If we rarely think so, that is because we take utterly for granted the structures of culture, mind, politics, spirituality, and even calendar, Sunday as holiday, to which it led. None of those structures was foreordained, and indeed to grasp the epoch-shaping significance of Constantine's embrace of Jesus as he saw him, I'll add. His sponsorship of Jesus' cause Imagine how the history we trace in this book would have unfolded had the young emperor been converted to Judaism instead. I say this, it doesn't matter. I mean, God can do things how he wants to do them. But Constantine was not converted to be a Christian. He took upon himself the cloak of a religion. A religion that did not have its beliefs and doctrines and creeds within the pages of the New Testament, but rather through sinful man's teaching, pride, arrogance, and a desire for control and power. That's all that this gives him. And so what became spread over the entire world at that time? Was it biblical Christianity? Was it true Christianity? Did it follow the teachings of Jesus? No, this is something entirely different. And this is what needs to be told and taught and explained to our Jewish friends. It is a nearly unthinkable turn in the story imagined in retrospect, but in prospect, such a conversion would have been no more unlikely than what happened. And to entertain the idea is to wonder how Judaism, instead of Catholicism, see he explains it there, he lets us know that this is a very specific brand of what he calls Christianity. And I would say that it's not Christianity at all. Would have fared as the lo locus of political and religious dominance. When the power of the empire became joined to the ideology of the church, the empire was immediately recast and re-energized, and the church became an entity so different from what had preceded it as to be almost unrecognizable. It didn't become entirely something different. It was something different before it became Constantine's thing. I'll tell you that much right now. It goes without saying that the conversion of Constantine for the church and empire both led to consequences better and worse, although not for the Jews for whom from this nothing good would come. That statement right there should give us some kind of an idea, some kind of a warning that nothing from this would be good for the Jewish people. That should give us some kind of an inkling on whether or not this was true Christianity. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. He also said, in so much as you've done unto the least of one of these my brethren, you've done it unto me. Depart from me, I never knew you, you that work iniquity. That is a very descriptive statement of what we see as the church in Carroll's mindset. In his book, When the Cross Became a Sword, now this man is a born-again Christian, Merrill Bolander describes this transition. Constantine's burgeoning church state with Augustine providing the intellectual support completely severed the church from its Jewish roots. Completely. Christian Rome, quote-unquote, okay, this is not true Christianity, ended the usage of the Jewish calendar, including Jewish Sabbaths and festivals. The Roman calendar we still use today was the result. Scripture was filtered almost exclusively through a Greco-Roman paradigm. They took the things that they liked. They took the things that fit with their Greco-Roman Hellenistic point of view and then made it Christian, quote-unquote. 
The following is an actual profession from the Church of Constantinople, which was required of all Jews who accepted Jesus as their Messiah and wished to join the church. This would later be forced upon them. What I'm about to read to you is something that was uh, given to the Jewish people who agreed to join the church. This is what they had to proclaim. I renounce all customs, rites, legalisms, unleavened breads, and the sacrifice of lambs of the Hebrews, and all the other feasts of the Hebrews, sacrifices, prayers, aspirations, purifications, sanctifications, and propitiations, and facts, and new moons, and sabbaths, and superstitions, and hymns, and chants, and observances, and synagogues, and the food and drink of the Hebrews. In one word, I renounce absolutely everything Jewish. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul making that statement? Every law, every right, and custom. And if afterwards I shall wish to deny and return to Jewish superstition, or shall be found feasting with the Jews, or secretly conversing and condemning the Christian religion instead of openly confu confuting them, and condemning their vain faith. Then let the trembling of Cain and the leprosy of Gehazi cleave to me, as well as the legal punishments to which I acknowledge myself liable, and may I be anathema in the world to come, and may my soul be set down with Satan and the devils. This is something that was at one point given voluntarily to Jewish people that accepted Jesus as their Messiah, and later forced upon them by violence. I hope now that we can see that what was created with Constantine's vision in the early fourth century in proclaiming what he called Christianity as the official state religion of the Roman Empire and having his whole entire army baptized to thereby become Christian and the subsequent persecution and anti-Semitism that began to grow out of that. It's almost like we can see in the cause and effect, in the inception and in the following actions, that through and through this movement is not Christian at all, not Christ-like at all, but in fact an imposter, a false church. We've seen the origins of the true church being in the pages of the Tanakh, in the pages of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Messiah coming to die for the sins of Jewish people all over the world and also for the Gentile. We see that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christianity is very Jewish in its foundation and in its roots. This is what we need to communicate with Jewish people. And maybe, like me, they've had relatives. Relatives, generations and generations past, that paid the ultimate price for being Jewish, that died at the hands of those that claimed to be Christian. That is a huge hurdle, mentally and emotionally, for a Jewish person to get over. We need to help them understand the truth. As hard as it may be, we need to help them understand and uncover the truth that those people were not Christians, not in the slightest. Not any more than I'm a bird <laughs> were these people Christians. And so hopefully you'll be able to better communicate that after these lessons with your Jewish friend. We'll see you in the next lesson. Shalom.